We're glad you're here joining us in another uh, Green Living Seminar. Um, I'm Elena Traster, Professor of Environmental Studies. This semester's Green Living Seminar is organized around the theme, Greening the City. All of these presentations are free and open to the public. They take place here in the Feigenbaum Center for Science and Innovation, Room 121 on Wednesdays at 5.30. And if you'd like to take a look at the schedule for uh, another couple of upcoming presentations, as well as a link to our YouTube channel where you can find recordings of prior presentations, you can go to www.mcla.edu slash green living, one word. As usual, we'll have a presentation of about 45 minutes today that'll be followed by a question and answer session. So make sure you uh, remember your questions um, so you can bring them up then. Before I turn it over to tonight's speaker, make a quick plug for next week's presentation. We hope you'll join us again next week on April 13th. We'll be hearing from Nancy Nyland and Ann McCallum, um, who will be presenting a talk titled Williamstown Composts, Lessons from a Community Composting Pilot Program. Today's presentation, titled Three Carbon Farming Stories, will be given by Dr. Nathan Phillips, professor in the Boston University Department of Earth and Environment. Thanks so much. All right, thank you, Dr. Traster, and thank you all for, for coming. And I had the most fabulous uh, trip down Route 2 from Boston area here, just such beautiful, beautiful land. And this is kind of a talk about land. Uh, and I think farming occurs on land. And I just want to do a shout out to the land of the Mohicans, uh, which is the area we are on, and, and honor the indigenous people whose lands that we are on. Uh, and so I want to also do a little bit of framing before I jump into these three stories about carbon farming. And I just want to say that when I go to the grocery store these days in Newton, Massachusetts, just outside of Boston, I'm seeing like some supply chain issues in our food system. Uh, I'm seeing things that are kind of showing that, you know, some of these supply lines are fraying. Um, the olive oil in Ocean State job lot was like missing a lot of brands. <laughs> um, you just start to see things like that. And we have seen, if you ride a bike, supply chain issues. It's been here since the pandemic started. And in this constrained world um, where our systems have become more and more centralized, whether it's the electric grid, the water grid, um, utilities, uh, big agriculture, uh, we're seeing the, you know, the vulnerabilities of large scale systems. And so this is a, uh, a set of stories that I think offers a direction in 2022 for me, it's all, it's all about local resilience, uh, adaptation and mitigation to climate. That's something we can do, we can empower ourselves to do as we have uh, you know, a world that is really um, you know, uh, being fueled by fossil fuels for geopolitical conflict. And there are ways in which we can lessen our dependency on these centralized and vulnerable uh, systems. Um, agriculture is about a quarter of the global uh, greenhouse gas inventory as well. So it's a big driver of the systems that are actually putting us in a more vulnerable situation um, to start with, uh, driving the climate chaos. So that was a heavy introduction, I know, but I'm gonna to pivot to what I think are some exciting solutions um, that can be implemented in various ways all over the place. And we do have the tools at hand to really address the predicament we're in. So three carbon farming stories and just wanna acknowledge co-authors Catherine Con Connolly at the BU School of Public Health and Sarah Beth Buckley, a postdoc at the University of Cambridge who is an alum of, of BU as well. Okay, so I'm gonna be talking maybe about ways, I don't know how much you've thought about carbon farming, and, but, but I see actually like composting on campus. I saw this right in the lobby and I'm thinking, you're already doing carbon farming. I saw the bike share uh, poster on your bulletin board. Um, that's not car necessarily carbon farming, it's carbon offsets. I see just walking on campus, 
that you get it. You're doing these kinds of things. I saw the biodiversity for li of a livable, livable climate poster on the bulletin board, so I, I know you, got, you, you get it. Um, so maybe a bit unconventional about harvesting people's breath uh, for carbon farming. Carbon farming off the electric grid. And this one is policy, my attempted at alliteration, policy pipelines to pastures. Okay, and I'm gonna try to weave together a couple concepts in that last one. So let's start with people's breath. And I understand uh, from Professor Traster that some of you read a little bit about this, uh, but this is Sarah Beth Buckley when she was doing her PhD, and this is her carbon farm on the roof of the building on Commonwealth Avenue in Boston that we're at, and, and they're spinach plants. Uh, it's a replicated study there, and those tubes are providing air uh, but they're providing air that uh, came from inside classrooms where people like you and me were breathing. Our breath is, is 40,000 parts per million CO2. The outside air is like 420 parts per million CO2. So we are a potent source of CO2. And Sarah Beth had the idea of, of harvesting and harnessing that CO2 for testing effects on plant growth. Um, uh, as well as for, uh, you know, crop production, food, eating. And so this is the system that she came up with, uh, delivering high CO2 to spinach plants, and in some of the other ones was just the same flow of air, but not with the high CO2 from classrooms, from uh, just outside. So this was written up in this story in Boston a few years ago. And here's basically the idea of this kind of carbon farming. We call it also building metabolism in the context of urban metabolism, that kind of framing. And so the idea is really a kind of a circular CO carbon economy where the breath, the 40,000 parts per million coming out of our lungs um, is ejected. It has to be because we need ventilation. So at some level, you need to have air exchanges with the outside to keep the air fresh, right? And with that goes energy. Either you're, you know, you may be ejecting cooler air and having to bring in warmer air when you wanted it cool, or vice versa. So there's an energy exchange, and that means carbon as well, right? Carbon dioxide to produce energy potentially. Um, and then there's the CO2 exchange itself. So this idea is to take the CO2 from our breath, where it's expelled, um, use it to uh, elevate the CO2 in crops, or it could be it could be food crops, could be fiber crops, whatever's uh, appropriate for the area. Um, and then there's this whole area in which our electricity mix and the how green it is, how carbon intensive it is. Uh, interacts with this whole system. So the idea is basically to, to begin to circularize some level of our, our own carbon uh, uh, emissions. And so this is amazing. In a classroom like this, maybe if it was more full than this, maybe like 75% full, you would get this kind of day-to-day uh, -day variation. So this is the CO2. Here's 500. We're, we're at like 400 and 20 outside, right, in the ambient well-mixed atmosphere. Uh, so that's the kind of baseline here. And you can see on the weekdays when this is a uh, classroom, a high school classroom uh, at, at Boston University. Has, there's a high school there. It's called Boston University Academy. And this is a classroom with students in it. And so you can see that their breath uh, more than doubles the CO2, triples the CO2, even up to 2,000 parts per million on that Tuesday. And on the weekdays when no one's in there, there's no elevated CO2. So it shows uh, the possibility. Now, the photosynthetic response of most plants, uh, whether whatever me metabolic pathway they may use, C3 or C4, uh, are highly responsive to these levels of CO2, okay, in terms of at least their photosynthetic rate. Now, from photosynthesis to the growth and the quality of the food and all of that stuff are, are a bunch of other very interesting questions, but it's definitely in a photosynthetic, I mean, in a physiologically very, very uh, important range of variation. And so when growing spinach plants, um, I'm just not gonna get into too great of a detail, but 
independent of wind speed, these are two different wind speeds of regular air flowing to these plants, uh, compared to either low or high wind speed or low wind speed uh, uh, provision of air with that elevated CO2 from the classrooms in it, you can see these two are bigger than these two, and it's quite significant uh, in terms of the dry weight growth. So this is, a, this is like the most basic measurement you might make, uh, bordering on simplistic, of the effect on plants, just like how much more of it is there. There are so many, many more interesting questions to ask about um, what could be happening, but we definitely see a response of, of uh, carbon dioxide. Um, and so, you know, that was a kind of a pilot study. Um, there are so many other questions about, well, do you just, would it be better, could you do this in a greenhouse, a semi-enclosed thing on the rooftop of a building, for example, and trap more CO2 before it goes out? What are the limits to which you can take that how much CO2 can be sequestered, uh, and what other kinds of indirect uh, benefits might there be, like, like the evaporative cooling that could uh, alleviate uh, cooling needs inside of a building, because as you know, when you sweat, the evaporation takes away a tremendous amount of heat. So there's a lot of those kinds of uh, direct and indirect energy and carbon uh, and even water uh, savings, uh, infiltration, um, and, and those water services offered by uh, these kinds of, of uh, rooftop gardens uh, coupled to the buildings with CO2. All right, so that's uh, the first story. And then let me talk about an extension of that story, which is now starting to add a layer on top of what we just kind of saw in a, in a different twist. And I'm going to just full disclosure say this is a business pitch, literally, because we, uh, Sarah Beth and I, entered a competition to see if we could get 10,000 bucks. And we actually made it to the finalist round, but then we didn't make it. Uh, but this is kind of, I've excerpted, excerpted some parts of, of the pitch that we made. Um, so it's called Climate Smart crops, and this might make you, I don't know, you might have mixed feelings. I've had mixed feelings about like growing stuff indoors. It's like, well, shouldn't we use the sunlight? You know, shouldn't we use the natural provisions instead of like putting things inside of containers like this and providing artificial lights and things like that? So when I first started thinking about this, I was like, no, yeah, I would never, never do something like that. Um, because, you know, are you burning fossil fuels to actually do this? You know, is a, you look at the life cycle and all of that stuff. I've come to uh, think that there is a role um, for indoor growing operations. It could be offsetting seasonal constraints. Um, you know, it, could we do things in the future of food framing like grow coffee inside a place like this instead of having to uh, export it, uh, import it from you know, halfway around the world um, with, you know, questionable labor standards and practices and fair uh, trade and those kinds of things. So, um, you know, lots of interesting questions there. Um, and so you can see some technology here. Now, truth be told, the pitch that we made for $10,000 that we didn't get was for a cannabis growing um, competition. Um, and so that's what we pitched it for. But in our minds, this could, this should and could apply to a lot of different kinds of plants um, for which you, there may be a justification for wanting to grow them indoors. Okay, so here's kind of the pitch. So when people are growing whatever it is they're growing indoors, it is a very, very intensive energy operation. So this is like one of those thermal images of, of a grow house. And this might have been, it's probably an illegal one. And so we are cooking the planet in a lot of different ways, including the growth of, of indoor growing operations. And so the idea is to like, you know, can we do things better? And just to give you a sense, I mean, this is a cannabis, uh, a high intensity grow light uh, energy consumption um, share of versus compared to 
quick service restaurants, hospitals, large hotels, primary schools, you know, per square foot. So they're just energy intensive. I mean, if you've gone into any indoor greenhouse, it is really intense. Even if it's that blue red, uh, you know, targeted uh, uh, spectral lights that they use, it's still a very, very intense usage and it gets very hot in there as well. Uh, so you can just see some of those statistics there. And so here's how it collects, connects to the grid, because that's all provided from electricity, from the grid, okay? Now we know a lot of things about the grid and how to work around the grid to be able to use the grid at opportune times when it's at its cleanest, meaning most carbon free, most renewables on the grid, uh, and it's most affordable. And the great thing is those things happen to coincide. Um, re when renewables are abundant on the grid is when the prices become most favorable on the grid. That is a huge, huge climate opportunity, okay? Um, it, and, and we need to focus on that because when we focus on that, we can actually clean the grid like to 100% renewable rapidly. So this is actually the New England grid at a snapshot in time. Every five minutes they put up these um, prices that are color coded. Light blue means it's a very uh, low price of electricity at that moment in time. $12.98 per megawatt hour if you follow those units. But the point is that it's a dynamic grid. That same day, a few hours later, this map might turn yellow to orangish as prices spike, okay? So very dynamic over even hour to half hour to five minute schedule uh, time steps. At this moment in time, this was the mix. And this is every five minutes. You can download this app, the, the independent system operator, New England. This is the grid operator for our area of the country. And we even, we know enough about weather forecasting, what's gonna to happen to the temperature, the sun, the wind, all of these things to know um, into the future, what do we expect the demand to be by you know, all of us, whether it's turning on coffee machines or taking showers at predictable times, those kinds of things. So we can actually see when the prices are, uh, when, when the demand is, is varying and with that demand, uh, the, the prices, and the cleanliness of the, the carbon-free um, grid uh, becomes known. So we can then think about like in our own human activities, well, maybe we can exclude certain activities that we don't need to do during these periods of time. Maybe the, the wash could be done here instead of here. Those kinds of things. We have all kinds of technology that are coming on to help us to do that. But all of that technology is really kind of focused on humans. Okay, so we have all these gadgets, these smart gadgets now, um, that we can kind of like have the house lower the thermostat by itself. We don't have to do it all, right? It can know our patterns and all of that kind of stuff. So there's all of this stuff geared towards humans in terms of energy and carbon management. Um, and they're doing this like with the Nest um, thermostat with, uh, this one's called, uh, I forget, but this app is called, um, it's not watt time, it's something else. But anyway, um, you know, it's basically looking at the intensity of carbon per megawatt hour over, over hours and as well prices at the same time and optimizing on, on those. Um, so it's related to money's value and control. And this is appealing because, um, you know, uh, people care more if they have a choice and they, they care more about knowing that their companies are responsible. And then, you know, basically our ability to control stuff with mobile devices has really, really exploded as well. So we have these things that can um, help control the devices and learn from us. Um, there's, there's definitely um, balance in that kind of nexus as well. And now I wanna to shift to say like, that's all about humans and our, when we take showers and put on coffee machines and run the dishes, um, the whole plant world is, is, this is kind of like, it should apply, but how, how would it apply? So it's actually a fascinating question, but with these grow operations, which are expanding dramatically, 
as like, for example, cannabis, that industry is growing dramatically. It's becoming a very, very big energy sink um, and carbon source. And so we could think about, well, um, what do plants need like eight hours of sleep and then, you know, eight hours of sunlight? And, and we all know that, that, I think we all know like different kinds of species of plants are gonna have different uh, photo period needs, right? Um, and, and other kinds of environmental conditions for, for growing. But we start to get into very interesting questions um, when we think about like how we can use the same kinds of approach to our human systems with electricity shifting um, load and dynamically adjusting um, our consumption and think about how plants might be able to do that. So, um, so this is what we had proposed and um, are still proposing if there's another grant uh, opportunity that comes out. Um, climate smart crops uh, basically looks at the supply of electricity and the demand for electricity in real time and projected over like the next 24 hours to decide whether the lights go on or go off, basically. Um, so it optimizes the use of the electricity for growing operations when it's the cleanest and the lowest priced. So basically you look at that um, uh, price forecast um, on the grid and then you do your scheduling um, for the next 24 hours because the New England grid projects everything out actually to 48 hours, what they expect the prices and the carbon intensity and that whole mix will be. I mean, it will vary a little bit off of their projections. Sometimes they get it wrong, um, but it is something that allows you to predict and schedule not just the lights, the, but the pumps. If you wanna put CO2 in there um, to enhance growth, um, et cetera, et cetera. You can turn on the lights, then turn off the lights um, for this purpose of, of growing. Um, and uh, yeah, so that's uh, that. And then, you know, this is basically something which we think will be very profitable uh, in terms of when you look at those prices on the grid, they can, the wholesale real-time prices on the grid can vary um, by like a factor of 100 within a given day even. Um, and so it, it is something that could uh, generate uh, funding. Okay, last um, story I wanna tell you, and how am I doing on time? 5.53 and we started at 5.30, right? Okay, so do, not doing too bad. Um, okay, so what does this mean? Policy pipelines to pastures. And so this actually mixes up a lot of different things and I, I hope I don't lose you because they're all swirling around in my head as well. But this is about policy. It's about serendipity. I, I landed in a weird place around now over 10 years ago as I'm a tree physiologist, I'm a forest ecologist, and I stumbled into the world of methane gas leaks because they kill trees, because I'm a tree physiologist. So my career about over 10 years ago really broadened, it's almost like a wormhole into this whole other world of methane. And so methane is carbon, right? CO2 is carbon, methane is just CH4, it's carbon. Dealing with methane can be a version of carbon farming, okay? So I'm gonna try to tell you a story here. It's gonna go all over the place, but maybe in the Q&A um, we can clear things up a little bit. So in 2013, we published the first study of its kind in any city uh, on the globe, documenting thousands of gas leaks from the natural gas pipeline system that runs under our streets and sidewalks um, in many places, uh, including North Adams, I think. Uh, you, are you on gas here, mostly? Yeah. Um, and so here are 3,356 gas leaks in the city of Boston, okay? Uh, this is, again, 2013. The situation hasn't changed that much in, in 10 years here. Um, and that led to, a, it started by, um, for me, uh, realizing that these gas leaks kill trees, but then it became this whole other set of issues, like, well, how much greenhouse gas is coming, how much is actually coming out? Not just how many leaks are there, but what's it all amount to? Um, 
you know, what are the safety issues? What are the air pollution issues? All of those kinds of things um, have developed from that research. But um, one line was, I, there was uh, this person I met, um, Saber Hussein, who um, is in the Boston area, reached out. He, I think he splits his time between uh, Boston and Dhaka, Bangladesh. And he reached out and he just wanted to know about like these gas leaks and how do you measure them? And like, he thinks there's a problem back in Dhaka, Bangladesh with gas leaks under the streets and sidewalks. And so we've developed this conversation when he's in, in the Boston area, we talk about that. And he also wrote this um, op-ed, um, you know, a, a, a year ago or so, um, that was based on our conversations. So he's really trying to advance understanding methane leaks from whatever source it may be in Bangladesh. So we struck up this really good rapport, uh, kind of comparing and contrasting. This is an explosion that happened in Dhaka that was related to a gas pipeline um, leak. Um, so that was something, a, a new friendship and, and colleague internationally that came out of this Boston work, okay? so. Um, meanwhile, also back in, when was this? This is like four years ago. As I started to get into this methane leaks issue, I started to think a little bit more like, well, where else is the methane coming from? Wetlands, landfills, oh, and cows. Everyone talks about cows. And I, I wanted to know like, um, oh, well, well, you know, uh, how big of a problem is that, um, et cetera. And so I'm not, I'm not an expert on bovine physiology or anything like that. Um, but I went to this uh, conference at Dartmouth College, I think three years ago, called Cows, Land, and Labor, Local Farming in a Globalized World, which had a bunch of expert panels on that. And I just wanted to sit there and listen, like whenever they bring up methane, I'm gonna perk up and just, I wanna learn about what's going on in the world of, of, of methane, because I had heard, like, you know, it's, it's a really big problem with the, um, the waste lagoons and the waste stream methane, and then also the methane coming out of the breath of the cows is really, really big. Um, and I also knew, and at this um, conference, they were mentioning this um, documentary about smaller family dairy farms in New England that are, were and are just getting really, really crushed economically. Uh, just not being able to make it. And, and for me, when, when I go into the grocery store in Newton, Massachusetts, and I look at the milk shelves, you know, the price comparison between the larger operations and the smaller operations, it makes it very hard for anyone to make the choice for, you know, the, the, the smaller, you know, um, uh, maybe better run operation. So, I mean, I knew that viscerally just from my own consumer experience, but, um, you know, uh, this documentary and that, that, um, that conference, Cows, Land, and Labor, really hit home the problem. So, at that conference, I had a couple really excellent uh, side conversations with people, including someone from the, I think it was the New England Dairy Council. And I had been thinking of this um, idea uh, that has developed, Oh, but let me hold there for a second and just say, at that conference, they, I also learned about some really amazing um, developments in um, managing the methane emissions from, from dairy and, and cattle. And one, this is actually quite recent. I mean, it's uh, Science Friday, but it's based on research, a lot of research happening at UC Davis um, and some other places on, you know, adding a little bit of, uh, of this red seaweed algae to the feed of cattle really cuts the uh, methane emissions by more than half here. I think there might have been some hype. I had heard like 95%, you know, reduction back a few years ago. Um, so, but 50% um, reduction is, is, is actually very sizable. Um, and also I had started to learn that and I think you'll hear this from Biodiversity for a Livable uh, Climate, if you see that documentary, or um, is that uh, pasture management can really make a big difference in um, carbon accumulation and sequestration, okay? And so the Marine Carbon Project is one out in California 
where biogeochemists like Wendy Sil Silver, Professor Wendy Silver, worked with uh, dairy farmers to look at how pasture management might um, be able to, instead of fouling waterways, and instead of, of creating methane emissions and nitrogen ox uh, di uh, nitrous oxide emissions, could actually be retained in the soil and even bioaccumulate carbon because it's a fertilizer, right? And, and so if you do it right, what could result? And so some of this work was presented at that same conference I was at. Um, and you know, the, the you'll hear this, uh, you know, the biodiversity for livable climate people like really hammer this home. But this is the paper that they published in 2013 in a very rep, uh, ecological applications, like a very important journal, um, that basically said that with the pasture management, putting the um, uh, compost, the manure, uh, into the soil, not on the surface, but into the, the soil, um, that it stimulated both above and below ground carbon store net primary production is a term for that, by these values, 2.1 to about five megagrams carbon per hectare. That number you don't have to remember, but that's like actually a pretty big number. That's, that may be like um, more than half of what a New England forest would absorb, uh, uh, you know, a thriving New England forest would absorb per unit ground area um, in, um, in the same amount of time, okay? And that's without including the direct addition of the carbon in the compost itself. It's what that compost has stimulated that is the additional drawdown of carbon. So that is uh, pretty exciting. When you put together the possibilities we have for feed management as well as pasture management, it puts together, and if we can quantify those things in terms of avoided methane emissions, we can actually start to think about methane pricing. Okay, methane pricing. So we've all talked about carbon pricing. You've heard about carbon pricing, right? CO2, and that should happen. It's been difficult to get it going, I think, um, in some ways because CO2 is just, it comes from everywhere and it's just, it's so mixed up. Um, methane is much more tractable and priceable. And the thing is, it is carbon pricing and it is happening. It is happening, um, and it's likely to uh, continue. Oh, but before before I get there, here's uh, here's a, a manure injector. It takes the cow manure in liquefied form, and then it goes down the the pasture. And every so many feet, it will inject the manure down below the surface, um, several inches into the soil, and that way it doesn't blow off evaporate and blow off, become crusty. It doesn't go into the waterways. It has that bioaccumulation uh, function to it. Um, but here's where the market for methane is actually happening. Uh, California is really moving on this, okay? And it, this is a recent article. Um, this is actually like in January of this year. They're calling it a gold rush in cow manure in California. And they've created policy that prices methane. They're not doing it in the way that I think I'd love for it to happen in Massachusetts and New England. I'll explain that in a little bit. Um, but let me back up and say, how did this get going? Okay, well, the antecedent of a now policy, state policy that incentivizes uh, dairy farmers to actually produce methane not to reduce methane, but to produce methane. Um, the antecedent for this was a catastrophe that occurred in Southern California in the fall of 2015 called the Porter Valley Gas Leak. It was like the leak of Deepwater Horizon, that uh, catastrophe for oil, it was that version for gas. Um, it was a deep geologic st storage uh, of gas at like something crazy, like 9,000 pounds per square inch in that deep, deep um, reservoir. And the well that tapped into it that they would use to feed into the gas system for parts of LA, uh, something broke like a couple miles down. 
So there's just like the casing broke. And so it became a geyser that was uncontrollable and they had to do, just like the Deepwater Horizon spill BP back in, in the Gulf of Mexico, they had to come in from like an angle and try to like sever the line, you know, and so it took like, it leaked for like five months. It went from 2015 into 2016, just a geyser and uh, nosebleeds and headaches and hospital visits for the uh, community in Porter Ranch. Um, and uh, so out of that came a settlement that was ordered by the state of California to Southern California Gas, the responsible party, for like, I, I forget, it was like maybe $270 million. But the way they structured it was that that money would go to dairy farmers to produce an equivalent amount of biogas that was leaked out of the Porter uh, Ranch uh, leak. So it was kind of like a trade of methane for methane, but it was all about producing methane, right? Didn't actually reduce anything, um, but they're calling this the cow power renewable biogas. Um, and in actually, in, in my view, I think there can be a role for biogas production um, on dairy farms, but I think it can be done like one way well and 99 ways badly. Um, uh, so I think it, that has to be very, very, very carefully considered. But I also know that demonstrable, quantifiable reductions in methane emissions, we can do that. We've got these sensors and the ability to actually monitor and verify this farm with this baseline methane emissions because they didn't do pasture management, they didn't change the feed, had this many methane emissions. And by implementing these measures, they have now cut their methane production by X percent or X kilograms or tons of methane. So that can be quantified readily um, and then it can be priced. And where are some things that it could be priced from. Um, when you do good and you reduce methane emissions, you could get a payment. There's another great big source of revenue that could go into a fund, and that is the gas leaks from our pipeline system, okay? Because we know how much is leaking out of our pipes, or at least we have some estimates of that. We can constrain that, and there should be a price that's put on that. The thing that makes a, a methane market actually like um, maybe more inevitable than a CO2 market in terms of the speed is the speed at which it destroys the climate. And um, it's, 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 it's something that the impact of reductions of methane emissions uh, have a huge impact. So you, you may have heard that methane is like a, a greenhouse gas on steroids. It's like CO2 on steroids. Some people put it anywhere, where, depending on a, a kind of a time horizon, from 25 to 86 times as powerful um, on a mass for mass basis as CO2 is. So it is a super greenhouse gas, okay? And so if you put a dollar, or let's say $20 uh, per ton of carbon dioxide, I shouldn't even say what that number is because it's way too low. Um, you can think about multiplying that same number by a factor of 25 to 86 uh, if the greenhouse gas warming potential is a thing that you're valuing that for compared to CO2. So it is actually uh, potentially very, very lucrative um, to, to do this. And so of all things, this story comes back to Sabir Hussein, who has uh, linked up with a colleague uh, so he's also thinking about cows in, in Bangladesh, at, which are the most um, valuable asset uh, that exists. And so I'm actually uh, evaluating this cow shed monitoring device, which will monitor methane, humidity, ammonia, and uh, make an alarm if the values get too high. 
Um, so I'd be happy to pass this around if you want to look at it. You can see it's in, it's like in pilot demo form. So it, they're just getting started with this. I'm not part of this business. I'm just like, you know, um, evaluating this thing for them. But they're very sophisticated. I've met these people. They're even doing cow facial recognition. Um, and uh, it's, it's so f amazing how they've appropriated all, all, so much of the stuff that's going on, you know, in tech and surveillance and all of that stuff. And they're, they're doing this with cows. Um, so uh, that's, that's a very interesting thing. Um, okay, so uh, yeah, I, I wanted to just share those three stories with you. Um, and I know I just kind of abruptly ended at that story. So um, I'll just say that, uh, we are, I am looking to partner and find, um, you know, a dairy farmer who might want to work on something. So if any of you are connected to dairy farmers, um, you know, I don't purport to know a lot about dairy farms or cows. I just know methane. And um, if there's a way to work together um, and show something, can be done. What, and I also know about methane from gas leaks and how that, that's like $90 million a year in lost revenue, just leaking into the air every year in Massachusetts. So we need the incentives to be lined up so that the gas companies can reduce, can be more incentivized to reduce the leaks and funds can flow to like dairy farmers so that that price of milk, you know, can kind of like be, become more competitive. Um, and, you know, so, uh, so I guess I'll just um, finish by saying, going back to the very uh, beginning framing remarks about, you know, the, the predicament we are in globally um, is fraught and perilous. But I am really, really um, uh, confident in the solutions that we can today put into place at the local level. Whether it's, you know, the electrification of mobility, our, our opportunities with e-bikes or e-trikes or little pod cars that uh, accessibility can be there if we make the safe infrastructure, um, with, with solar and wind energy in all of our sectors, the solutions are, are here and can be implemented um, locally. And it, you know, it's, it's also jobs, et cetera. And I guess I wanna just end with, we've done this before, we knew this. We produce 40% of our fruits and vegetables in the United States from small and community gardens. And the oldest one still in existence is like a half mile from where I teach in Boston, the Boston Victory Gardens. And they're still going. And we w I actually took a class in there two days ago and walked through and it's just like, it's just um, an amazing experience just to be there, even if you're not gardening, just walking through it. Um, but yeah, we have these solutions. Um, and uh, yeah, even if they're from the past, um, you know, it's, these are solutions we can build on, you know, today. So thank you.